Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church, member of the Evangelical Lutheran Synod on this third Sunday in Lent. And our theme for today is, Let Us Heed Christ's Call to Repentance. And we begin with our first hymn. <laughs> Responsible. 
Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled. For no scorn of those who are at ease with their contempt of the power. Remember, when times are hard, the 
the Lord is our strength and security when everything else seems to have given away. Our Old Testament lesson is from 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 through 7. David sang to the Lord the words of this song when, he, the, the, when the Lord delivered him from the hands of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverance. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and my horn of my salvation. <clears throat> he is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. From violent men you saved me. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I am saved from my enemies. The waves of death swirl about me. The torrents of destruction overwhelm me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress I called to the Lord. I called out to my God from his temples. He heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. Here endeth our first reading. In the epistle lesson, Jesus is giving his personal message to the churches of Asia Minor. Through John, he commends them for their hard work and their perseverance, but he also speaks of their love that had grown cold towards each other. The epistle lesson for this, the third Sunday in Lent, is written in the second chapter of Revelations, reading verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things say, he who holds the seven stars <clears throat> in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are prophets and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolodians, which I also hate. He who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Here endeth our epistle, and we join in the gradual. We beseech thee, Almighty God, look upon the hearty desires of thy humble servants, and stretch forth the right hand of thy majesty to be our defense against all our enemies. And the sentence of the season, Christ humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. In the Holy Gospel, Jesus again is faced by a man possessing a demon. Jesus showed his power over evil and the authority he has to heal this miracle benefits the one who is healed, and it also benefits others as Jesus shows his divine sonship as God's Son in the flesh. The Holy Gospel is written in the fourth chapter of St. Luke, reading verses 31 through 37. Please rise for the reading. Glory be to thee. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teachings, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit that, of an unclean demon, and he cried out in a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him into their midst, he came out of him and did not hurt him. 
Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is! For the authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Here endeth the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Praise be to thee. Let us confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 12. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn. Give each.
each of us a caring heart, O blessed Savior, to love and seek the lost. Help us to overcome our fear and to grant us courage to share the hope of salvation with those who have no hope. Make us faithful in our daily lives so that in all we say and do, we glorify your name. Amen. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text is written in the 13th chapter of Luke, beginning at the first verse. We read as follows in Jesus' name. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Salome fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, Leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. O Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your words are true. Amen. Many times in our lives, things happen to show us how small we really are in this big world. If one flies in a plane and rises above the clouds, you seem like just a little spot in a vast ocean of snowy white clouds. Or if you can look down and see how small a car or truck looks, you realize how small you really are. Other times, we come to the realization that our life, although seeming long to us, is very short in the passing of time that we need to pay close attention to it. We need to enjoy and share the blessings that God has given us. We could say there are little warnings given to us as we grow older. Warnings that tell us that we are coming to the end of our lives and to be prepared for that day. During Lent, we look at God's gracious purpose of eternal life, that through his death, through the death of his Son, yet of what value is this work if you do not repent of your sins and believe on him? Therefore, our theme for today is, let us heed Christ's call to repentance. Dear fellow redeemed, when terrible things happen to people, have you ever wondered if they had done some terrible sin? In our text, that's just what those following Jesus wondered. Jesus had been very critical of the crowd, and some of the crowd wanted them to show that they were aware of how God punishes sinners. Jesus preached about the coming judgment. He warned his followers that repentance is absolutely necessary. So some of the people had come to Jerusalem reporting this terrible news. It seems that there were priests and some laymen who were helping them in the temple offering sacrifices. And Pilate ordered his men to rush in and cut these men down with their swords and thus their blood was mixed with the blood of their sacrifice. The crowd was shocked by this news. But what Jesus said would have a deeper impact on them. Jesus was compelled to correct the interpret 
what had happened and answer this question. Were the Galileans worse sinners than other people? Some of the people believe that these Galileans must have been guilty of some particular sin, otherwise God would have not permitted them to be slain while worshiping in the temple. So now Jesus gives another example in verses 4 and 5, where it seems that 18 men were killed by the tower that collapsed in the city of Jerusalem. This tower was part of the old city wall near the pool of Salome, and it possibly fell due to disrepair and age. So Jesus asked the question, were these 18 men greater sinners than the other men in Jerusalem? Has anyone ever thought that when we see some great tragedy that happens to someone else in the war, babies being killed, mothers, old people? Or has anyone ever asked you, knowing that you believe in God, how could a loving God let this happen? It's very easy then for us to reason that the tragedy is a punishment for some great sin. And very easy then to set judgment over them and wonder if they are more guilty than others. And then we go so far as to reason that since nothing happened to us, we must be better. Looking at the world around us, though, we see the newspaper, radio, TV reports daily filled with tragedies of misfortune. We hear of car accidents, people being killed by robbers, an angry spouse, an angry parent, war and invasion, which we see each day on the TV. And sometimes people are killed for no apparent reason at all, as was reported this morning on the news at a fundraiser where people were shot. And other people take their own lives. So people wonder then, those that died, were they worse sinners than we are? Well, this is just what people were thinking and wanted Jesus to answer. Jesus answered them, I say, I tell you no. These people were not killed because of some particular great sin that they had committed. None of the Galileans or the Jews that asked this question were any better in God's view than those who had died. All sinners, Jesus warned, would meet a terrible judgment unless they repented, and the same is true for us. In Romans 3.23 it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This all happened when man fell into sin, and since that time, no one still alive is better than anyone who is dead. Jesus tells us that the death of every unrepented sinner is a great tragedy. He points out that all people need to repent. So what does the word repent mean then to us? Repent means to know you are sinners to confess your sins, and then cling to Christ for forgiveness. And with the help of God, we turn from putting ourselves first to love our neighbor, to turn away from sin and to the righteousness of Christ. In God's law, we see that all people are in need of repentance and that we deserve God's just punishment. But to repent also includes faith that only God can affect. Through the law, we see our sins and are condemned, but from the gospel, by God's grace, we receive faith, which comes to us by the Holy Spirit, and we see our Savior. As it tells us in John 3, 5, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. With faith we receive that righteousness of Christ 
Through the word and sacraments, we receive the righteousness and can stand alone before God out of thankfulness to God then for these free gifts, namely forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. We are to do good works in a life pleasing to God. The knowledge of this repentance is absolutely necessary, for without Christ's work in our hearts, we are spiritually dead in our trespasses and sin, and we'll spend eternity in hell. Then Jesus tells this parable of the fig tree. He wanted them and us to know that there is still time to repent. In verse 6 it says, A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree, and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Jesus used this parable then to describe the life he expects of people in his world. When planting a fruit tree in a vineyard, it is planted to bring forth fruit. If after some time it does not, then it is cut down. So let us, uh, so it lets us, after three years, the owner demanded that the tree be cut down, and he replied, or, it tells us that after three years, the owner demanded that the tree be cut down. He had waited long enough. He wanted it removed. But in verse 8, it says, Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year. I will dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, cut it down. You see, the vine dresser here pleaded for one more year. He did not want to see the tree destroyed and promised to do everything possible to care for the tree so that it might become fruitful. What does this parable mean to us? God is the owner of the vineyard. He is patient, but in his law he does threaten the just punishment of sin, being unfruitful. He demands fruit in keeping with repentance. If that fruit does not appear, the tree will be cut down. We will die and be condemned to hell. Now the vine dresser who pleads for more time is our mediator, Jesus Christ. As it says in 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. Jesus bases his intercession upon his atoning sacrifice. God's grace comes through his Son, and his time of grace is extended. We are the fig trees. If left to ourselves, we would all be unfruitful. We would be stuck in our own sinfulness, as it says in Romans 8, 7. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to its law, nor can it do so. God's righteousness of the law would demand that the axe be laid to our roots, that we be cut down. But it is for this reason that our Savior, Jesus Christ, came to this earth. Jesus was the most fruitful tree that was ever planted on this earth. Who would ever think of cutting him down? But that's just what happened. We celebrate that at Lent. He lived a perfect life in our place, and he died on the cross to pay for our sins. And by his death, God forgave all our sins, the years of unfit fruitfulness, the breaking of his commandments, the many sins that each and every one of us have. God now sees us through this spotless lamb, Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes to us. He gives us strength to live God-pleasing lives, to produce fruit which is pleasing to God. 
God the Father is patient. God would have all men come and be saved. And he spares us so that we have time to repent and bring others to him. We have been planted in good ground. He has given us his precious word and the blessed sacraments. We have been given a new life in Christ. And God expects to find fruit. God hears the intercessions of his son. And he gives us a time of grace. Are we living in a time of grace? Yes, as many of the signs, if not all spoken about in the Bible about end times, have happened or are happening now. So we have been given this time of grace. We must bear fruit. We must live out our lives to God's glory. Bring others to faith. Keep our vineyards in order. For soon the time of grace will pass. God's love and patience will soon end. And justice will be carried out. Then it will be too late. Then Jesus, the bridegroom of the church, comes. Those that are in unbelief will be cast into the fires of hell. Brothers and sisters in Christ, ask yourself, are you ready? Ready for the hour when the Lord calls you? Have you put aside the things of this world and give all glory to God? Have we heeded Christ's warning to repent? Have we told everyone we know or even those we meet that there's still time for repentance? Well, not one of us can say, yes, we have done all that. It is only by the grace of God that you and I know that we will be in heaven. We thank God that by his grace he sent his son who died for our sins or your sins and my sins and all the sins of the world. He brought forth fruits of faith in our lives, giving glory to God for his many gifts. We ask God to give us the strength to share this with others. This marvelous blessings which you and I enjoy and use this time of grace to be trees full of fruit that others may see our good works of faith and glorify God. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. And now may the peace of God which passes all our understanding keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise for prayer. Oh, oh Holy Spirit, enable each of us in our spirits to be faithful in every good work.
give us love so deep that we desire to share our possessions and be moved to give generous offerings to the glory of our Heavenly Father, who spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for all of us. Use our gifts to send messengers, messengers to the salvation of Jesus' name throughout the world. Hear us for our Savior's sake. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who art worthy to be had in reverence by all the children of men, we give thee most humble and hearty thanks for the innumerable blessings, both temporal and spiritual, with without any merit or worthiness on our part thou hast bestowed upon us. We praise thee especially that thou hast preserved unto us in thy purity thy saving word and the sacred ordinance of thy house. And we beseech thee, O Lord, to preserve and extend thy kingdom of grace, to grant unto the Holy Church throughout the world purity of doctrine and faithful pastors who shall preach thy word with power and help all who hear rightly to understand and truly believe it. Send forth labors into the harvest, open the door of faith unto all the heathen and unto the people of Israel. In mercy remember the enemies of thy church and grant unto them repentance unto life. Be thou the protector and defender of thy people in all time of tribulation and danger, and may we in communion with thy church and in brotherly unity with all our fellow Christians fight the good fight of faith, and in the end receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow thy grace upon all the nations of the earth, especially do we entrust thee to bless our land and all its inhabitants, and all who are in authority. Cause thy glory to dwell among us, and let mercy and truth, righteousness and peace everywhere prevail. To this end, we commend to thy care all our schools. Pray thee to make them nurseries of useful knowledge and Christian virtue, that they may bring forth the wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamities, by fire and water, from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine. Protect and prosper everyone in his appropriate calling and cause all useful arts to flourish among us. Be thou the God and Father of the widow and the father of his children, the helper of the sick and the needy and the comforters, comforter of the forsaken and distressed. Except we beseech thee our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers, together with the offerings we bring before thee, which is our reasonable service. And as we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life, to prepare for the world to come, doing the work thou hast given us to do while this day before night cometh when no man can work, and when our last hour shall come support us by that power. Receive us into thine everlasting kingdom, through Jesus Christ thy Son our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost forever and ever. All these things we pray in the prayer you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Please be seated for our next hymn.
blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without him. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.